you don't know, my name's Brian. I'm one of the pastors here at Faith Community, and I get the privilege just of continuing our Creed series with you this morning. I would like to tell you that this is going to be like that perfect Mother's Day where we just uplift ladies. Um, but it's, it's not that message today. We're going to continue, like I said, in our Creed series. And as we continue, we're going to talk about the death of Jesus, you know, him being suffering under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried. And we're going to take a look at that. Uh, and I want to just kind of, you know, give you some understanding here, because if you're like me growing up, this story was beautiful to me but yet at the same time was very perplexing. It was very confusing to me because as I was growing up and I would hear this story, a lot of times in my mind I couldn't register how a Jew dying over 2,000 years ago would impact my life today. And if I'm honest, even as I grew in my teenage years, I struggled because I thought of this story in lights of like a Chinese proverb, right? Like it's a good story. It's meant to be told to encourage you to do good. And, and my parents were great about instilling those beliefs in me, but I just wrestled with it because, yes, it spoke of beauty, but at the same time, I couldn't quite understand how a person dying over 2,000 years ago could impact my life in this way. And so this morning, as we continue in our Creed series and we talk about this idea of the death of Jesus, and in a few moments when we stand and just recite the Apostles' Creed, I want to challenge you to really focus in on that part, to think about that. And as we go through, just process what that means. And as we've been going through the series, we've challenged you with just thinking about po popular cultural isms that happen in our world today that can steer us in a counter direction to what Jesus really wants for us. And the two that I want to challenge you to think about through the entire message today is simply this. Number one is intellectualism. And now you might be going, Brian, I thought we were supposed to be smart people. You're right, we are. We're called to be smart people. God wants us to be thinking people. We're even called to love him with all of our minds. We're not talking about intellect here. I'm not asking you to check your brains every time you come in the doors of the church service. What I'm asking you to do is to think about the idea of intellectualism, which is this, that if man thinks enough or he thinks in a way that he can essentially change himself. Like if I just think the right things, eventually I will change myself. If I just think about these things that magically it'll happen, we can't do that, right? And the second one I wanna challenge you with is legalism. And what is that? Legalism is just thinking that if I do the right things, if I live up to some sort of list and I do good, that somehow I can magically tip the scales in my favor with Jesus, and I can become in right standing with Jesus based on what I do. And if you've been in church, you've heard us talk about that. We can't do enough good in order to be in that. And so we're going to dive back into this and thinking about it, and I want you to understand, and I'm going to give you just the key part right from the beginning. I'm not even going to let you wonder, but Jesus' death reconciles us to God, and it creates a people or a community that is both local and universal. And what do I mean by local and universal? What I mean is it's, it's a place that's here. It's also worldwide, but even more than that, think about it in this concept. It's also social, right? It goes beyond culture. It goes beyond just your so social economic status as well. Jesus has died so that you can be reconciled with him. And so we're going to go ahead and read the creed, so I'm going to ask you, if you would, to stand with me. Uh, it'll be on the screens, and just read with me here. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He had descended into hell and the third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of the Father Almighty, from whom we shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of the saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. Like I said, today we want to look at that suffered under Pontius Pilate, crucified dead and buried. 
And what that is in the Apostles' Creed is that is facts. They are giving you facts that Jesus suffered under Pontius Pilate, and you can go to historical accounts and they prove this, that Jesus was there at this time, that he was a man in this culture, in this time period, and he went through this, that he suffered under Pontius Pilate, that he was crucified because of the Roman uh, governance in that area at that time. This is how they would have killed him. And in that, that he was dead. It wasn't a hoax of the apostles. It wasn't this toy, a play on words that he actually died and he was buried in a rich man's tomb. And even outside of Christian influence, you can read historical documents and, and just books and all of that. And they will tell you that this is accurate. This is truth. That what has taken place, Jesus was a man, he lived, he died, and he rose again, which we'll get into next week. But understanding that, I don't want to just focus on the facts, right? Because you're going, Brian, we could all just leave. Those are facts. It's good. I'm good. We can go celebrate Mother's Day. But there's truth underneath these facts that I want to reveal to you today and, and let you see what's occurring in the death of Jesus. Because it's, it's more than just a historical picture it's more than just a good story. Like I said earlier, there's importance to this. And like I said at the very beginning, namely, it reconciles us to God. The death of Jesus on the cross reconciles us to God, and it creates a community for us. Or if you will, it creates the church. The death of Jesus creates the church. And it's just this beautiful picture. And so I want to jump in, and I'm going to warn you. We're going to read a lot of scripture right here up front. But hang in with me because it paints a beautiful picture of what's taking place here. And if you want to turn with me, you can turn to John chapter 18 in your Bibles or on your device. If not, it'll be on the screen. We're going to start in verse 28. And what you need to understand coming up to this point, that Jesus has already been beaten twice to this point. He's been arrested and he's just been abused even up to this point. And so we're going to pick up in verse 28 right here. It says, then they led Jesus from the house of Caiaphas, the high priest, to the governor's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the governor's headquarters so that they would not be defiled but could eat the Passover. So Pilate went outside to them and said, what accusation do you bring against this man? And they answered him, if this man were not doing evil, we would not have delivered him over to you. And Pilate said to them, take him yourselves and judge him by your own law. And the Jews said to him, it is not lawful for us to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill the word that Jesus had spoken to show by what kind of death he was going to die. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, are you the king of the Jews? And Jesus answered, do you say this of your own accord, or did others say this to you about me? And Pilate answered, am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done, Jesus? And he answered, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. And I'm going to hit pause there for a second because I want to just remind you, some of you may know, you may not. The story starts this way, is that Jesus has one of his disciples, Judas, who betrays him, sells him out, and the chief priest, along with um, his servants, they come to arrest Jesus. Right, And they meet Jesus in this garden, and they go to grab Jesus. And one of Jesus' followers, Peter, what does he do? He grabs his sword out of his sheath, and he chops off one of the servant's ears. Right, And Jesus immediately goes to Peter, hey, put your sword away. That's not how this is going down. And he bends down, and he picks up the servant's ear, and he puts it back on the servant. And I don't know about you, but if I was that servant, I'd have just walked away right there and been like, I'm out. I can't do this anymore. Um, you know, and then he, they go on to arrest him and they take him in. And what the beauty about this is, is what Jesus is doing, he's, he's backing up what he's going to say to Pilate. Because right from the very beginning, if his kingdom were of the world, where what they would have known by coming in and taking force, Peter was in line with that. Peter thought that this is what Jesus would have wanted for him to set him free. And what Jesus is declaring, even though he doesn't say it out loud to Peter, what he's declaring to everybody is simply this, is, is that they are not taking my life. I'm giving my life. See, that's the beauty. They're not taking his life. He willingly gave his life. And that's what he's declaring right there. So let's pick it back up. And this is what it says. It says, then Pilate said to him, so you are a king. 
And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. And Pilate asked this question, which I believe is a question we're still asking today. Pilate said, what is truth? After he said this, he went back outside to the Jews and he told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the time of Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? And they cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. And remember, Barabbas was a robber. And if you read the other gospel accounts, it also tells us that he's a murderer. And so they, they demand the release of a murderer and a thief over Jesus and says, then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And understand, flogging is not just a whip, right? They tied Jesus to a post and they took whips with rock and glass on the end of them and literally ripped the skin off of his back in this part. That's what the word flogging means. And I would challenge you and encourage you to watch Passion of the Christ, not because it's the end all in movies, but it gives you a great picture of what Jesus would have had to endure during this time. And then it goes on to say, And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing a crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. And Pilate said to him, take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself son of God. And when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid, and he entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, will you not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? And Jesus answered, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not a friend of Caesar's. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar." So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out, sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement. Now it was the day of preparation of Passover, and it was about the sixth hour, and he said to the Jews, behold your king, and they cried out, away with him, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, shall I crucify your king? And the chief priests answered, we have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them over to be crucified. And if we had time to go through all of the gospels, you would see the accounts and the views of what happens during this process. But what you need to understand about the the crucifixion, and I think at times if we've been in church or we've heard the story, it can be watered down at times. We need to understand that he was spit on, he was beaten, he was just tortured, he was humiliated, he was embarrassed. I mean, they were doing everything that they could do possibly to shame him. They would strip him naked, And they would parade him around as some sort of circus freak. Pilate himself even sent him to Herod. And when he comes to Herod, Herod's whole thing is, is I want you to do a miracle for me. I want you to perform. I want you to put on this show for me. And when Jesus refuses to do that for Herod, Herod has him beaten and then sent back to Pilate. And what you need to understand, all of this is pre cross. It's pre-crucifixion. This isn't something that is part of the crucifixion process. This was all before. Jesus was beaten so bad. He was abused so bad that when the time came for the crucifixion, he couldn't even carry his cross. As he walks, he, he has no strength to carry his cross. And Roman guards are forced to pull a random bystander out of the crowd, Simon, to carry his cross to Golgotha, the place where Jesus was crucified. And then that's when the crucifixion begins because they nail his hands and his feet to the cross. And what you need to understand about the cross, you may know or you may not, it was one of the most excruciating ways to die. Because can you imagine, number one, being nailed to a cross, a piece of wood that you have created, 
The steel that Jesus would have created in the very beginning is what's holding him to this cross. And the only way for him to breathe is to force himself up on the nails in his feet high enough so he could catch his breath only to just then drop back down and feel the weight of his entire body on the steel pins that are in his hand. And the way you would die is that you would drown in your own blood. You would suffocate because of the weight of your own body and you just couldn't do it. And that's the picture of the cross. See, I think sometimes when we come to church and we can be in these environments so often, we miss the key component. This was gruesome, right? And I'm not here to get you to like spoil your lunch before you ever get out there, but I want us to understand that there's power in what has taken place, right? He suffered under Pontius Pilate. The creed holds to this because they want you to understand the facts because the facts reveal the truth. He suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, he was dead, and he was buried. And that's all facts, but it's truth. And you might be going, Brian, how is that beautiful? You know, and I think if you've been in the faith and you've shared the faith, you understand the beauty of God reconciling us back to God. But think for a moment, on the outside. Doesn't that sound a little crazy? I mean, when I was growing up, that was my thought. I couldn't picture how could someone take that for me, right? How can we wear crosses around our necks or on our bracelets or tattoo them on our arms? Because what we're doing is, is we're taking the cross, making it the symbol of Christianity when it's really somewhat like an electric chair, right? I mean, that'd be like you ladies on Mother's Day, you open up your gift and it's a Pandora bracelet with an electric chair state put on it, right? You walk around, what's that? Well, that's my electric chair. But that's, that's what we've done with the cross. And I'm not here to shame you into like taking your cross off your neck or going to get your tattoo removed. That's not what it's about because it is beautiful at the same time. It's beauty, but the beauty comes from the understanding of what the cross has done for us. It's not the symbol that makes it important. And I think too often we notice the symbol more than we notice the truth behind the symbol. And that's where it's at, is understanding this. Because when we begin to look at the cross, we should be reminded each and every time we look at it that there's something in us that's missing, right? We long for something. There's a desire within us for something, right? And I think that desire within us leads to felt needs that we have, right? That's why we have marriage troubles, or we can have addiction issues, or we can struggle with various things, maybe anger, right? Those are symptoms of a bigger problem. Now, I'm not going to say those symptoms aren't significant. They are significant, but they're still a symptom of a bigger problem. And what's that problem? It's simply this, is that we were created to be in community with God. We were created to walk with him and live life with one another. And when sin entered the world, hear this, it fractured both of those. It destroyed both of those and it created a longing inside of man for something. And what we often do is we run from thing after thing to try and fill that void because we never see the truth of the cross. We never see the truth of the crucifixion and the death of Jesus. We don't let it fully invade who we are. And we need to get back to that place where we understand that that restlessness that longing, that desire that's within us is a cry for the person of Jesus. And the more we get close to that, the more we can understand and begin to see that the death of Christ reconciles us to God. It creates a community. But even more than that, it reconciles enemies of God, right? Think about that for a moment. It doesn't reconcile good people to become better people. It takes people that are complete opposite of what God wants and brings them in. That's what it does. The cross does this. Understand, it creates an avenue where we don't have to approach with shame and fear anymore. We can approach Jesus as we are. And when we do that, we're free. We're free. And now think about this understanding of enemies, right? Is there anybody that would raise their hand and say, I'm good? Like, I'm good. I'm a good person, right? I don't see any hands, right? It's okay, because I'm not good either. The Bible's very clear. It tells us that there's not one person that's righteous. No one is good. 
Isaiah even tells us that all, like sheep, we've all gone astray. We've wandered and done our own thing. And so we have all become enemies of God. The Ten Commandments even show us that we can't live up to God's standards in and of ourselves. We can't do it. There's nothing that we can do. No one is righteous. You're not good. I'm not good. And if you think you're good, chances are you're comparing yourself to someone else just so you'll feel better about yourself. I mean, it's truth. We all do it. And this shouldn't surprise us. It shouldn't surprise us that we're this way, right? Think about that. This is the one thing that when Jesus lived that they were always on him about throughout scripture. This was the rip on his ministry every time is that he is a friend of sinners, right? He eats with prostitutes. He hangs out with the low lives. He's always around people that just seem to be the outcasts of society. He even brings in the worst of the worst to be his disciples, right? I mean, think about the idea of Matthew, right, who is a tax collector. And we all know that story. But I think in church, we don't understand the full concept because we think of Matthew and we compare him to Zacchaeus, right? And we automatically go to that song in our head, right? Zacchaeus was a little, little wee man, little wee man was he, right? I mean, think about it. And if you have no church background, you're like, oh, this guy is insane right now. <laughs> like, what is that? Because it makes no sense to you. And that's okay. Don't worry about it because it has no bearing. But, I mean, we, we wrap ourselves in these protected arenas and we fail to see the gravity or the realness of this story. Because, yes, I think we know this, that as a tax collector in that time, they would have been charged with taking $20, but they would have taken 50 instead. And so they would have ripped people off. But it's more than that because you got to understand that in that time, Matthew and Zacchaeus, would have had to purchase that right from the Roman government. So what they were doing is that they were funding an army that was literally responsible for the eradication of their people, for the rape and murder of hundreds of thousands of people. And they were doing it on the backs of their neighbors and their family members. See, that carries a different weight because I can't find in our society today a comparison we don't understand that logic. We've never had an army come in and eradicate our whole lifestyle and then someone of our own family, someone in our own community sell us out to make a dollar. You might get close for some of you, but we haven't experienced that. But that's the weight. And so what is it saying? To them, Matthew was a piece of trash. Zacchaeus was a piece of trash. And yet Jesus brought them in. He brought them in. And more than that, he made them a disciple. He made them close. He reconciled them to God. See, that's what the cross does. And see, and the beauty of this is, is I think we get stuck on John 3, 16. And it's an amazing verse. And I'm sure if I asked you, you could, most of you in this room could quote it. But don't forget verse 17 where it says he has come in the world not to condemn the world, but to save the world from condemnation, right? He is a friend of enemies. He's a friend of enemies. So that begs the question, how do we become enemies of God, right? I wanna quickly answer that for you. I think it's really one of two ways. One, we're irreligious. And what does that mean, Brian? It just means that we don't wanna have anything to do with the spiritual. Basically, we say to God is, I don't need you, Right? And the other way is, is religion. And hear me for a second, right? Because the irreligious person says, I don't need you, God. I'll, I'll use drugs, sex, money, climbing the corporate ladder, you know, getting what I can get out of life as means to say, I don't need you. Sometimes we can become legalistically religious and say, God, I've got my worship. I've got my small group. I've got my class that I lead. I got this thing, this program that I'm in. So I don't really need you because I got these things. And that's how we become an enemy to God. When we start placing the significance on the things we do versus the person of Jesus. And see, we use those same tools, but just in different ways, right? Different ways. And we can... We can see that 
throughout the life of Jesus, if you go back into the Bible and you begin to study Jesus's life, you'll see that he is the friend of enemies, that he rescues prostitutes, that he saves women who have been in marriage after marriage and the person that she's living with currently isn't even her husband. And the Bible even alludes when you go into the history, it was probably like a sex for rent type of thing. Like she was literally selling herself to stay in a house. And yet God calls these people back to him. And even after his death and ascension, which we'll get into in a few weeks, you see it continually to happen, right? Think of Saul of Tarsus, who we know as Paul, right? He's responsible for the murder of Christians, that his whole purpose in life was to destroy Jesus' following and the church as we know it. That was his purpose. And the common equivalent that I can find in today's culture would be like that of a commander in the ISIS army, right? That's, that's Paul's status in this place. And what does Jesus do? He brings him back. He brings him back. And then we can see on the complete opposite side, he redeems a woman named Lydia, who is just an amazing woman. She's gifted with purple cloth, right? Like she is, she's got it all. She's got a house in the city. She's got a house on the coast. I mean, all the kids want to wear her gear, right? It's like Nike and Jordan right? Everybody wants what Lydia has. And she's a God-fearing woman, just happens to be in the wrong gods. She was serving and worshiping the gods of her culture. And what happens? Jesus gets a hold of her and he redeems her and he reconciles her to God. And so we see both extremes. I'll even give you one more, the Philippian jailer who is charged with guarding Paul who if you go back into the history and look at who he was, is he was probably a soldier on the front line. So he was responsible for the rape and murder of hundreds of thousands of people. He would have been in the midst of this and he's trying to back off and live this blue collar life. And so when he gets Paul, understand, he beats Paul, he tortures him without being told to. He just, he wanted to do it, so he did it, right? He's like that guy that just wants to sit on the couch and watch the game, right? Like... Don't get in my way. You mess with me, bad things are going to happen. He's, that's this guy. And what happens? Jesus reconciles him. He reconciles him. And we can go on and on and on. A demon-possessed girl reconciled. A eunuch reconciled. See, it begs us to question this. Are you tired? Are you tired of trying to figure it out on your own? See, because Jesus reconciles us to God. Hear that. Hear my words. Jesus reconciles us. Not what we do, not who we are, not who we think we can be. It's Jesus. Amen. That's it. He's the one that reconciles us. But there's more to it. Because not only does he reconcile us to God, which is beautiful, but he redeems a people. He purchases a people, which in a sense creates the church. And we see this in Acts chapter 20, verse 28. It says this. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers. To care for the church. And here's where you, if you underline, underline this next part or just highlight it on your device. It says this. Which he obtained with his blood. Amen. Jesus purchased us. And I want to kind of paint this picture for you. So we're going to have just a little bit of interaction. And so I want everybody to be a part. I'm not going to call you on stage. If you're asleep, I need you to wake up and look at me because we're going to be a part of this. I'm just going to ask you some questions and you can just raise your hand if, the, if it's appropriate and just hold it there for a couple seconds and put it back down because there's going to be a series of questions. You with me? Yes. Can you do that? Yes. All right, good. Because we're going to do it anyway. So how many in here have a master's degree or a PhD, or a doctorate? How many? Anybody? Awesome. Awesome. How many in here have an undergraduate's degree? How many in here have a high school degree? How many would say, I nailed my GED? It's awesome. I love it. Don't be ashamed. That's cool. How many would say, you know what? At about the seventh, eighth grade, I just said, I'm done with school. I can't do this. So. It's good. Watch this. How many would say this, that you were saved or you gave your life to Christ in your teenage years? What about your 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s? 
Six, sixties, sixties, trying to look, sweet, I love it, this is awesome, seventies, anybody give their life, seventies, seven, that is amazing, right, yeah, it's amazing, do you see this, now, well, let's take it a little bit further, how many of you would say you grew up where your parents had means, they had financial provisions, so it allowed you opportunities that maybe you wouldn't have had if not. How many say, you know, I had financial means growing up? How many would say I didn't? That's just not me, right? It's good. How many would say this, that your parents growing up, they taught you about Jesus, like they even drug you to church if need be, right? Like, how many would say, nope, that's not the case for me? All right, let me ask you this one. How many struggle with some sort of addiction, be it drugs, alcohol, or anything? How many have struggled at some point in your life? How many would say, nope, that's just not me. I haven't struggled with that. Do you see what's happening? Do you see the beauty here? This is amazing to me because we look around the room and we see what God is doing. Through the death of Jesus, not only has he reconciled us with God, but he's purchased a people and he's created a community Right, this is when we talk about universal and local. Yes, we're local right here, but you can see across the spectrum of our cultures, our backgrounds, our upbringings, how unique we are, and yet Jesus brings us together, not just here, but across the nation and across the world. It's a beautiful thing, because we have people in here, yeah, we have people in here that would say, I have my doctorate, and we have some that says, I didn't even graduate high school, and yet you're in small groups together doing life together, and that's only possible because of the death of Jesus, right? We have people that are in here that would say, I've struggled with drug addiction in my life, and you have some people that says, you know what, I've never cussed a cuss word in my life, and the one time I did, it was in my head, and I think I still made it up. Right, Those are the type of people that we have here together that God has reconciled back to himself and is creating a community with. It's beautiful. He's taken people of different tracks, different backgrounds, and he's created a place where we can grow together, where we can learn together, where we can seek after him together without shame, without fear, without guilt. See, that's The challenge for us, that's what they're talking about in the Apostles' Creed. That's what makes it so amazing. That's why this is important to me, right? The death of Christ reconciles us to God. It puts us in a place where we can come to him. There's nothing that we can do. It's him giving it to us, and it puts us in a place where it is community. We have a place to belong, a place to be. And so what does that mean for us? How do we plug this in to our grid that we've been talking about when it comes to symmetry, clarity, community, and counsel? How does that make us become more mature Christians, right? How do we look at this statement of suffering under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried? How does that help us become more mature Christians? And I would challenge you with this. Maybe for some of you in the room today, you need to meditate on the ideal or consider This notion that the word of God and how it relates to your sin, right? What does your sin mean in the word of God? For some of you, it's the opposite. To bring symmetry into your life, it's you have to begin to see the weight of your sin. Because if you're honest, you become lazy. And you look at your sin and it's like it's not that big of a deal, right? But sin is important. Not because it's bigger than God. It's because God hates sin. He hates sin. That's, that's to declare. He hates sin. And if you want to see how much he hates sin, you just have to look at the cross to see how much God hates sin. You just have to look at the death of Jesus and hell in general to see the weight and the gravity of sin. And that's why God hates that. That's That's the weight of sin. And so that first step right there is figuring out where you are, finding out, you know, maybe I need to begin to look at my sin in the light of the cross on both sides. Now with that, looking at clarity, and I'm just going to say really one thing about this because I think it speaks for itself. It's if you are in Christ, if you've begun a relationship with Jesus, you are forgiven. 
There's no caveats, there's no asterisks, there's no what ifs, there's no what abouts. You are forgiven past, present, and future. You have been forgiven. That's, that's the truth. That's the clarity that this brings, is that you are forgiven. You can live unashamed before God. Think about it, right? Think about Paul who is the, like I said earlier, the common equivalent of a commander in ISIS, right? If you're sitting there going, my sin's too much, Brian. It can't be for you. Look at Paul. Like you and I, right? And I'm just going to be real and honest with you. When we see that, our first thought is, is can't we just eradicate them all? And what does Jesus say? No, I'm going to bring them back to God. I'm going to restore them. I'm going to redeem them. And so when you're forgiven, you're forgiven. Don't forget that side of it. And now that we have symmetry and clarity, what should we do in community? And this is simple. The death of Christ reveals how we're to treat one another. Did you know in the New Testament there are over 51 occurrences of one another? Now, I'm not going to read all of them, so you can take a break, you know. But I want to show you what they say, just a few of them. This is what they say. It says, love one another, serve one another, defer to one another, greet one another, encourage one another, speak life into one another, show preference to one another, outdo one another in honor. And I could go on and on, right? What does the Bible tell us? They will know you by the way you love one another. They know that we believe in Christ, that we are Christians by the way we love one another. That's the importance of the cross. The cross reveals to us how we're to love one another, that we're to encourage one another. We're to lay our lives down for one another, to lift one another up. That's what Jesus did in this moment. And let's be honest, right? People are difficult. People are difficult, right? You get on someone's nerves. Yeah, you thought I was going the other way with that, didn't you? But you get on people's nerves. But it's through the cross and the death of Jesus that those people can be long-suffering, that they can be patient with us. They can still be encouraging to us when we're difficult, when we're ornery, right? I know I get that way. Just talk to my wife. I can be mean at times. And it's because of Jesus, because of him reconciling us to God, that, that she's able to deal with me, right? <laughs> that she has the patience to put up with me, and I'm sure she'd say the same thing about herself. That's who we are, Amen. right? And then the last part of this, that I want you to understand how we see Jesus reconciling us. How do we counsel ourselves in this? Because this, I think, is, is the hardest one. This is the one that, if I'm honest with you, I struggle the most with in my life is this idea of free love, right? Because everything within us tells us that love ain't free. That's why some of you put makeup on to go to the gym. <laughs> Let's be honest. That's why a lot of us with our lives, we become used car salesmen. We try and show the best of everything because we want love. We want people to love us. And so in our minds, it is so difficult to understand the concept of free love. And that's what Jesus offers. He offers free love to us. See, and you would say this simply because I think the reason that we tend to go this way is you could just go, Brian, if you knew my life, right? You knew there, there's no way Jesus can love me. If you were able to see my thoughts and know what I think about, man, you would want me as far away from you as possible. And what Jesus says is simply, I got you. I know what you think. I get it. He goes, I know it's scary to be human. I know what it is. That doesn't bother him. And yet he still offers free love. Even though we're goofy, insecure, immature people, he says, I love you. And I want to give you the very best. Think about this. Because the Bible challenges us in this way. It doesn't say look at yourself to grow closer to Jesus. It says look to him, right? That we are to fix our eyes on him. He is the one that transforms us. Yet so often we turn our attention inwardly and go, well, if I can just fix this about me, I'll get closer to Jesus. And he's going, no, that's not how this works. Look at Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. 
It says this, therefore, since we are surrounded by such a great cloud of witnesses, let us also lay aside every weight in sin which clings so closely and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us, looking to Jesus, the founder and perfecter of our faith. And let's pause there. Again, that just reiterates that point, looking to Jesus. Why? Because he's awesome. He's the one that's figured this out. We're not to look at ourselves because if we do, we're going to fall into that trap, man. I'm not redeemable. I'm not lovable. There's no way that I can earn this love. We look to him because he's offered this. And then listen to this final part of this. For the joy that was set before him endured the cross. The joy. That's an odd word to put before he endured the cross, right? Because I don't know if I would have put joy there. But it speaks to the difference between joy and happiness. Because was the cross painful? Absolutely. Was it torture? Absolutely. But in Jesus' mind, the joy came because he knew what he was doing. He knew who he was doing it for. See, that's the difference. That's where the joy comes in. See, I think for some of us, we forget that, right? We don't understand that the joy Jesus' primary joy was in two things, right? And they tie together. The first thing his joy was in was pleasing God with his life. That was his primary response. But secondary to that, because he knew that it was part of his goal, was that he suffered and died for each one of us. He gave his life. Again, to go back to that point, he gave his life. They didn't take it. He gave his life so that we could have joy. How many in your wildest dreams would have ever thought that Jesus would save you, right? I wouldn't have. If you would know my history, I can tell you, there are still days that I struggle with this concept. Am I really saved? I mean, do you, do you really love me, Jesus? I mean, it's me we're talking about. Right? It's me. And he goes, I love you. And I've redeemed you. And that's why I can say, that this is the most beautiful story I've ever read, I've ever heard about, I've ever experienced. Even though it sounds crazy to an outside world, right? It seems like an electric chair. That's why I can look to the cross and I can see these things. And this is an invitation for all of us today to be reminded about the death of Jesus and this death on the cross that he suffered and I'm going to keep saying it suffered under Pontius Pilate. He was crucified, dead, and buried. The significance there is that. And so when we talk about this, understand this. Paul grabs this in Galatians when he says this. He says, but when God who has set me apart, even from my mother's wound and called me through his grace, listen to this, was pleased to reveal his son to me. Notice that word, pleased. God was pleased to reveal his son to you. Doesn't matter your background. It doesn't matter what you come from. He was pleased to reveal himself with you. And so when we talk about Jesus suffering under Pontius Pilate, crucified, dead, and buried, what are we saying? We're saying it's simple, that these are facts. These are things that actually happened. But the truth behind the facts is simply this. Is what is truth? It's the person of Jesus. That's the truth. That's what sets us free. The answer to Pilate's question over 2,000 years ago, what is truth? It was staring at him right in the face. And every time we look at the cross, that's what we are to be reminded of. That's what we're to remember, that we are reconciled back to God, that we are his and that because of his death, we can have community together. We can live together. We can serve together. We can love one another together. Yeah.